In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with you, Spirit. Dear friends, we come together on this 29th Sunday in Ordinary Time, Year A, as always, to celebrate God's love for us, to celebrate a God who demands of us total allegiance, total commitment, total fidelity. We come in a spirit of thanksgiving. We also come aware of and acknowledging our sinfulness. Lord Jesus, you have shown us the way to the Father. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you have given us the consolation of the truth. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you are the good shepherd leading us into everlasting life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, grant that we may always conform our will to yours and serve your majesty in sincerity of heart. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord to his anointed Cyrus, whose right hand I grasp, subduing nations before him and making kings run in his service, opening doors before him and leaving the gates unbarred. For the sake of Jacob, my servant of Israel, my chosen one, I have called you by your name, giving you a title, though you knew me not. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God beside me. 
It is I who arm you, though you know me not, so that toward the rising and the setting of the sun, people may know that there is none besides me. I am the Lord. There is no other. The word of the Lord. The beginning of the letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the Church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, remembering you in our prayers unceasingly calling to mind your work of faith and labor of love and endurance in hope of our Lord Jesus Christ before God and Father, knowing, brothers and sisters, loved by God, how you were chosen for our gospel did not come to you in word alone, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with much conviction. The word of the Lord.
the Pharisees went off and plotted how they might entrap Jesus in speech. They sent their disciples to him with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are a truthful man and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And you are not concerned with anyone's opinion, for you do not regard a person's status. Tell us, then, what is your opinion? Is it lawful to pay the census tax to Caesar or not? Knowing their malice, Jesus said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin that pays the census tax. They handed him the Roman coin. He said to them, Whose image is this? And whose inscription? They replied, Caesar's. At that, he said to them, Then repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the Gospel we just listened to, the Jewish authorities plot to entrap Jesus. The apprentices they send to Jesus begin with what on the surface might appear to be false flattery, but underneath there is something weightier. Teacher, they say, we know that you are a truthful man and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. The truth they refer to here is the law. Underneath this flattery is in fact a challenge to Jesus' rabbinic authority, his knowledge of an interpretation of religious law of the Torah. For in earlier incidents, by contradicting them on any number of issues, Jesus was, according to them, setting himself up as the alternate authority. And so by appealing to Jesus' legal expertise, they box Jesus in on two counts. In the first place, Jesus must answer the question, if he is truly a rabbi or loses credibility. And in the second instance, he must base his answer in scripture. The clever devils that they are, having boxed him in, they deliver what can only be a knock-out question. It is, for all practical intents, as brilliant as it is wicked. That's why Jesus refers to it as malicious. They ask, is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar 
or not. If Jesus says it is lawful to pay the tribute, he would be seen as a collaborator with the Roman occupiers and would alienate the people who had just proclaimed him king. If, on the other hand, Jesus says that the tribute is illegitimate, he risks being branded a political criminal and incurring the wrath of Rome. With either answer, someone would have been likely to kill him, the Jews for religious blasphemy and the Romans for political sedition. Jesus sees through the evil genius at work. And so, first, he talks to their intellectual dishonesty. Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Then, instead of answering, he requests to see the coin used to pay the tax. That Jesus himself does not possess a coin for me is significant. But that he requests to see the coin suggests that there is something about the coin, there is something meaningful about that coin itself. What's in the coin, we may ask? After receiving the coin and looking at it, Jesus poses a counter question. Whose image and inscription is this, he asks them. This counter question is important and so for two reasons. The first is that the counter question follows a pattern of formal rhetoric common in first century rabbinic literature in which there are four different steps. In the first movement, as it were, an outsider poses a hostile question to a rabbi. In the second scene, the rabbi responds with a counter question. In the third place, by answering the counter question, the outsider's position becomes vulnerable to attack. And in the very last movement, the rabbi then uses the answer to the counter question to refute the hostile question that was posed to him in the first place. We can see in Jesus' use of this rhetorical form one way in which he tells the people who are questioning him that I am in my own terrain in very much the same way as a modern lawyer would use formal legal rhetoric in a courtroom. But more to the point is the fact that the rhetorical exchange is used, he employs it to refute the hostile question that has been asked him in the first place. In the second place, because the hostile question was a direct challenge to the authority of Jesus as a rabbi on a point of law, his questioners would expect that the counter question be grounded in scripture, in particular, that that question be based on the Torah. That's so when Jesus comes away with two words, image and inscription. Those two words in the counter question happen. They play back into two central provisions in the Torah. And Jesus delivers on those terms. He delivers on the terms of his interrogators. For 
we know, they know that the first commandment of the Torah prohibits false images. It says, as Isaiah reminded us in the first reading, I am the Lord. There is no other. We also are familiar as Jesus' listeners would have been familiar with what we refer to today as the Shema Israel. The Shema commands that the law be inscribed in the minds and in the hearts of every believing Jew. That it be inscribed on the doorposts and on the gates of their cities. And so, while the verbal answer to the counter question of whose image and inscription the coin bears, we can imagine is a feeble, confused, bewildered Caesar's. The actual image and inscription on that coin for us is much more revealing. Why? The head of the coin showed a profiled bust of Tiberius crowned with the laurels of victory and divinity. Around it was inscribed, Tiberius Caesar, worshipful son of the god Augustus. On the tail sits the Roman goddess of peace, Pax, and circumscribed around her is the abbreviation High Priest. In a word, that coin imposes, it represents the cult of emperor worship. That coin asserts Caesar's sovereignty upon all who use it for any business transaction. No wonder Jesus does not carry one. Jesus then finally answers his interrogators. Then repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. The response begs the question of what is rightfully God's and what is rightfully Caesar's. My dear friends, in Hebrew tradition, everything rightfully belonged to God. By using the words image and inscription, Jesus had already reminded his interrogators that God was owed total exclusive allegiance. He was owed total love and unique worship. Everything else, including tax proceeds, belonged to God. In other words, Jesus skillfully points out that the claims of God and the claims of Caesar are mutually exclusive. If one's faith is in God, then God is owed absolutely everything. Caesar's claims are on that ticket necessarily illegitimate and he is therefore also owed absolutely nothing. If on the other hand one's faith is in Caesar, God's claims are illegitimate and Caesar is owed at the very least the coin which bears his image. Jesus' counter question, therefore, simply invites his listeners, and that includes you and me, to choose allegiances, and that once those allegiances are chosen, that we be totally committed and faithful to whom we have chosen to obey and to serve. In some accounts of this particular episode, the story ends with the words, when they heard this, they were amazed, and leaving him, 
they went away. I don't know whether there are any lessons to carry home from here, but one thing I tell myself is, if you think of tempting God, you had better be at your best. He will always win. And the warning of Jesus to Satan then also comes to mind. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. We shall now stand to recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. My dear sisters and brothers, God who is mighty has called each of us by name. With confidence, let us bring our prayer before the Lord of all. That our Holy Father, Pope Francis, will lead the church to stand against injustice and suffering in the world, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. prayer. That leaders of nations may have the courage to walk the path of peace together so that the most vulnerable in their lands may live with dignity and hope. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. That scientists working to develop vaccines for COVID-19 and other diseases may be blessed and supported in their endeavors. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. That those who work in bureaucracies will carry out their work with integrity. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That young men and women will be open to the voice of the Holy Spirit when discerning their vocation in life. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the sick and those who care for them may be strengthened by Christ's love, especially Braden Ahern, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. That the dead will feast at the eternal banquet, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all of our special needs and intentions, and for Teresa Suni Kim, Bernadette Seidenwand, Tom Tracy, and the people of this parish, for whom this Mass is being offered, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. Loving God, your ways are truth and life. Hear our prayers and help us to keep our hearts set on your kingdom that is to come. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Pray, sisters and brothers, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Amen. Accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Look, we pray, O Lord, on the offerings we make to your majesty, that whatever is done by us in your service may be directed above all to your glory. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For by his birth, he brought renewal to humanity's fallen state, and by suffering cancelled out our sins. By his rising from the dead, he has opened the way to eternal life, and by ascending to you, O Father, he has unlocked the gates of heaven. And so, with the company of angels and saints, we sing the hymn of your praise, as without end we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts we pray by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dew fall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The Mystery of Faith When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the death of 
Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you've held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis our Pope, Wilton our Bishop, his auxiliary bishops, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles, and with all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. The Savior's command and prompt by divine teaching, we dare to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, 
Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. spiritual act of Holy Communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament and that you are truly present in this holy mass. I have lovingly worshipped you by prayerfully watching today's mass. So by my membership in a mystical body, Please present me to the Father in your perfect sacrifice, O oh Jesus. Although I do desire to receive you as Eucharist in person at this moment, I cannot. I humbly ask that you come to me spiritually. I give myself to you. I love you, O oh Lord God. Hear my petitions and those of the Church, your bride, that we may be drawn by your Spirit towards our beautiful wedding, our beautiful wedding day in glory. Amen.
Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, we pray, that benefiting from participation in heavenly things, we may be helped by what you gave in this present age and prepared for the gifts that are eternal. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.